Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And I have uh, just not only one of the one of my favorite guitar players, this is Greg Martin from the Kentucky Headhunters. He's one of my favorite people. I have literally been like incredibly blessed to have met him. He's just a wonderful, kind human being. He's he's you know, in some ways changed my life. He's just a sweetheart of a guy and he's a, just a tremendous player. Uh, Greg's come out with a new record and uh, a solo project outside the Kentucky Headhunters. And we'll talk about that. Um, man, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Are you kidding, man? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Man, I love it when we get together like this. I know, it, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sick every time. <laughs> got a cold, got a cold. At but, least but, I, uh, I can't get it this time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I need to put a mask on. Uh, oh, let me just yeah, give you a quick background. Yeah, there you go. In, uh, in case you're not familiar with Greg, uh, most people know him for being the lead guitar player for the Kentucky Headhunters, a position he's held since 1968 when the band originally yeah. formed as itchy brother i was yeah. all of five then greg but i caught up to you now man you look better you look better than me at this point uh he's oh. also you do man he's also got a side project that just uh, came out with an album called martin smith mcgee it's greg martin dean smith and john mcgee and the band just have released a new record called eclectic lazy land it's very great it's a really cool record uh as always greg's warm tone of his 58 les paul a standard affectionately called hank it guides the melody and his soulful solos this is i feel like a, i wrote this like an art like a critic i don't this guy's a great guitar player he he let loose his inner paul cost off for this record and it's a great record and uh greg greg also has a radio show which we'll talk about i'd love you to check it out um man it's so good to see you again. I'm, I'm, it's been too long. It's maybe great. Maybe have you, some man. barbecue. Uh, bar well, we do need to do some barbecue. <laughs> we do. I have that we picture. Do do I took that picture when you were down here. And that, that's like, so every, anytime you call, your, that picture comes up. <laughs> of the, the two of us just eating barbecue. So it's a good memory. November 2019, when the world was a little more sane. Yeah, man. Right? Yeah. Was that, that was last year. It was last uh, year this time, yeah. I think it was November. I'm pretty sure. I can't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, you know. Is, and you're doing well. Yeah, man. I'm doing. You know, it's cold here. It was 36 degrees this morning. Same here. It's cold up here. Oh wow. Here. wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just uh, starting. It. You know, man. It seemed like uh, about two weeks ago it was still warm, and uh, well, about three weeks ago I was walking down the track and stuff. Now it's uh, it's just changed. Yeah, man. Christmas time is coming, man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about your record. This is not sure. your first side project. I know you've done several over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about some of your non-Headhunters projects and how talk about how this one came together and if you want to talk about Dean and John as well. Okay. Uh, well, I've known Dean, <laughs> Dean Smith, bass player. I've known Dean for years. And the funny thing is, Craig, uh, when I moved to Louisville in 1972, I worked at a printing company, Fawcett Printing Company, and I worked with Dean Smith's grandmother. And I, of course, I did, hadn't even met Dean at that point. And she said, oh, I got a grandson, you know, down in Glasgow, and he plays music and this and that. And then, of course, as I moved back down here in 1977, um, I, I knew Dean, but it got to know him better. And because uh, we have the same love for trios uh, and funk and, you know, things like that. And so, uh, I don't know. We started gravitating to play together back around, finally, around like, like 1990, 91. We had a, like a little group called the Crackers, <laughs> which was a fun <laughs> little band. We played, <laughs> we played Mountain Stage and, and stuff like that. And then... Uh, it eventually that morphed into um, Rufus Huff, you know, which was another side project. I think that was released in 2009 and Rufus Huff is, we had, we had one of our boys in the band had some health issues and he had to, he just had to take a break from it. And uh, me, and, me and Dean have done other things, but this, um, this project, which, which what we're talking about here, I mean, there you this go. is a project. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, you don't never plan this stuff because because my stepson John is the drummer, 
and the vocalist on this, and he's really responsible for most of the lyrics. Uh, really, he's a really, really good guitar player, too. He's got a group called Tail Dragger. Him and Dean play with Tail Dragger, <laughs> you know. And uh, But we just, you know, we've always had fun playing together because Johnny's a great drummer, just a, he's like Fred, real, yeah. really good swinging pocket drummer, you know, <laughs> and, and he can rock. And I love playing with Dean. Uh, we had played a few little live gigs for fun, and we just decided to go in the studio. No plans. And that was January of last year. The, the day you did that, you were on the show last time. I remember exactly. that. January 19th. Exactly. <laughs> January 19th, because I had just gotten off the cruise. That's right. The Southern Rockers. So, yeah, because you and I talked. I was up in the living room, and I was like going, nah. I didn't know what we were going to do. So what we did, we just got in the studio and we'd lay down and said, well, let's play a shuffle. Let's play a funky groove. And we just laid down about, um, I think initially we laid down about 11 tracks. And then um, there was maybe a couple of tunes that had, there, there was one, uh, Hard Time Killing Floor, which is an old, um, an old blues, Sleepy John Estes song, I guess, an old blues song. And um, the rest of Johnny came up with the lyrics. You know, he came back later and and sang the stuff. And then I add some guitar. Uh, but then I, on the bottom, on the bottom, which is the country song. Yeah. <laughs> the I mean, BMW you, did, country song. you did some great <laughs> picking in that on a well, couple, I couple of those that. tracks, man. I enjoy playing straight country. I don't get to do it much. You know, and uh, but Johnny had this song. So what he did, he recorded the drums uh, and a loose vocal and a loose acoustic guitar, and he sent it down to us. And we we just fleshed. I ended up playing, uh, redoing the two acoustics, adding electric. And I actually played bass on it because Dean said he couldn't play country bass, and I said, well, he can, but but uh, you know. It, it was just a, it, it wasn't meant to be a project. It just turned, it just, we went, went to the studio January 19th, 2019, recorded those grooves and it, it, and, uh, it just started morphing into this little thing, you know, and, and these things are not, we know we're not going to sell massive amounts of music. It's just stuff. I look at it. It's like you're almost leaving letters, you know, as yeah. we get older, you know, yeah. almost, you're leaving something behind, you know, that's the way I look at it. Well, I'll tell you, yeah. anybody from a record company listening to this, who's recording 11 tracks in one day? You got to sign these guys. <laughs> All right? I mean, seriously, <laughs> who does 11 tracks in one day? Well, I, I don't mind signing this over to a label, but as soon as they start talking about touring, I'll go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've done enough to, I, I, I love getting out on the road but but uh, just being gone all the time anymore it's like uh, i don't well you got a full-time band if how much can you've got i got a full-time band absolutely yeah. you know, I do. the headhunters keep you busy they do i mean considering this year we've had a break like everybody else has oh, but yeah. uh but uh the thing is you know um i i mean no i like to, me and johnny and dean would like to go out and do a little run here and there or some things you know i'm not i'm not totally against that at all you know that'd be great that'd be great it's a, it's a very cool, like it's a fun playing. it's a fun like record man well thank you it, it is it is it's just uh you know it wasn't like i say it was kind of a spontaneous moment so to speak and and i had no idea when johnny took the tracks back what he was going to write about uh and there's some pretty funny things he you know if you, you if you grew up in this area you, you get a kick out of it. <laughs> oh, there's a lo like local references to things. In, oh, lots of yeah. local references. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, um, my favorite song on the record is what you just mentioned, Hard Time Killing Floor. So tell me about that song. But you know what, too? I just want to qualify. Yeah, it is. It's uh, Skip James' song. Skip it's, James. Thank I, you. I thought it was... Uh, when I, I thought it was Killing Floor by Hendrix, and I was like, what's this song? It was really cool. Not, not, it was really cool, and I had to look it up. Tell, so tell me about that song. It's, my, it's a great track, man. Thank you. Um, well, you, you're correct. It's Skip James, because we were going to do Floating Bridge by Sleepy John Estes, but we didn't end up doing that. That's, that's where I was getting that from. Um, I don't even know how that song came into – I think that was Johnny's idea. 
Johnny's idea. Uh, the thing about Johnny McGee, of course, when I married Ruth, I had uh, married uh, in heaven. I, I got a family, and I had no idea that these kids, uh, Sherry, my stepdaughter, and John, were both going to be great musicians. You know, <laughs> it was amazing. And uh, but Johnny just took right to my record collection and started going downstairs. You know, like digging up the the BB King and Albert oh. King. And, Hold on one second. I just want to tell everybody, if you're not, if you're watching this on YouTube, you, this is like a small portion of Greg's record collection behind him. If you're uh, listening yeah. to this, this is literally a museum of like music it, that he's got. It really, truly yeah. is. I could take some pictures and send them to you if you want to insert some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will do that. That'll be good. When I, when I post this, that'll be cool. Yeah. And I've been collecting for years and I've got a quite a few albums too out in the garage and a few in here I, you know it's just uh it's just everybody's got their little um, their library or some got books yeah and i've got lots of music you know well even when you but, came down here you're like hey man is there a record store so i think we right we, we went to did. that place like yeah, maybe in saint pete or something like that it was a cool store I remember really that. cool yeah yeah but that's your passion yeah I'm I'm sorry, really, oh no it's fine uh but Johnny, yeah, Johnny, uh, of course, he was, God, when I married Ruth, he was just probably, he was just about 12 years old or something, you know, maybe 10, I can't remember now. And he, he loved grabbing my guitars and polishing them. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm going to tell one on him, because it, it's funny now. Uh, I had a, my buddy, Jimmy Brown, that ran Guitar Emporium in Louisville, uh, loaned me a, an old strat and it had to be like a mid 60s strat and i was thinking about trading into it and i brought it home from louisville and johnny decided he wanted to clean it he cleaned it so good he cleaned the uh the, the numbers off the knobs nice <laughs> <laughs> you know how do you explain was, how do you explain that one when you bring it back <laughs> no, i don't know what went down it's, it's kind of funny now but uh but uh I don't think I ended up with a guitar, but I, Jimmy forgave me, and it was no big deal anyway. But it, but what I'm saying is Johnny was was smitten by the guitar early on, but his first thing he kind of got into drums and uh, started playing drums with bands around here, and then uh, by the late '80s, early '90s, he had a band called Black Cat Bone, and they signed with a subsidiary of Electra Records. And they released an album, and they went out on tour. This is crazy, Craig. They went on tour with Ingbe Malmsteen. Um, Who oh put God. that together? And I'm assuming they I were playing don't. like blues rock, like classic rock stuff. Exactly, exactly. I don't even know who put that together. But the crazy thing, uh, there was a nine in 1992. I went out and subbed for Ed King and Skinner, you know, for a few weeks. Did you know about that? I did like, not know that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I met Ed, I guess it was, 90, it was the spring of 92, and at the Dallas Guitar Show. Yeah, that's a big and, show, or it used to be a, a huge show, I think, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I used to go every year. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been in five or six years. just didn't work out now because of my schedule. But... Uh, you know, I met Ed King, and uh, of course, Ed King knew I have his old the '58 I own, or or I'm a caretaker for. I don't know if we actually own any of this stuff or not. We're just taking good care of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he heard that he had a, a he has a Les Paul called Red Eye that got stolen, which was a '59, okay. and when he heard that his Les Paul was there at the Dallas Guitar Show, he went, he ran over to the booth where it was at on display. I just had it down him. And he he said, Oh, it's not red eye. But it was the first 58 he had owned for a while and traded off. So anyway, we hit it off. We talked. And uh I was out so in spring of spring of 92, I was out mowing back when I when I had enough gumption to to mow my own yard and stuff like that. I uh, I was out mowing the yard one day and I came in and got on the studio phone and he had left a message. 
He said, man, we need some help. Um, I, I broke my finger. And would you come out and do, help play some shows? Of course, you know, being younger, now I'd, I'd, I'd have to think about it. But, but I'm like, oh, sure, I'll do it, you know. Wow. <laughs> I, had, I did not know this. Yeah, man. I did. Uh, oh, yeah, I did. I did about uh, three weeks worth of shows. Love them, guys. Uh, what was that like? Well, you know, in, in retrospect, Craig, um, I really wasn't the right guy for that because the guys that play, that have come in to play with the Skinner thing, they become either Alan Collins. Uh, you know, they 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 they've really studied that, and and I was being a member of the Headhunters. I kind of was developing a style. I mean, I could no, you watch. have a your your style is totally different to that. But it's, it's different. They yeah. were so kind. They were so kind about it. They never, they never complained about anything because I didn't play the parts. Uh, matter of fact, I should have been playing a Strat out there, but I played a Les Paul into a Marshall. They were fine. I think they were just they were headhunter fans, and they just had it. We had a good time. Uh, they was great. I, I can't say anything but good things about uh, those guys. Yeah. And, it was really good. Of course, um, then, I, you probably don't know this, but uh, in 94, Gary called me one morning and actually offered me a gig in Skinner. He wow. actually offered, Yeah. And uh, we had, one of the other guys had quit. I don't know what happened. And um, Gary and the road manager called me. And, um, you know, we uh, – we, we had i won't bring any names up uh, yeah. but uh, as he said we're we want to ask you first if you would like to have the gig and of course it hit me like uh from you know out of left field so i had to i said well man i have to think about this because and i love those guys but but as soon as i got off the phone i said man i can't do that yeah you had almost going, 20, 25 we going, years with the headhunters at that point we were going That's... through a rough patch at that time we had a couple of, we had a couple of guys leave in 92 and it just wasn't a good timing. And I said, no, I can't. And I said, you know, as much as I love Skinner and um, you know, you just got to be who you are. And that, and I, I just couldn't switch gears. And I, and there's guys that can do that, man. They can sit there and they can get that stuff down uh, perfect, but that just wasn't what I was supposed to do, but it was, it was very enjoyable. But where I'm going with this? Yeah, but what a what a uh, that's a, a hell of an honor. I mean, I, you know, you, you obviously played a lot better than you gave yourself credit for a couple of minutes ago. They they wouldn't be calling you back and saying, "Hey, we want more of that." If it was not up, you know, I mean, they can have anybody. I, I would hope so. And, and yeah. uh, Gary was so kind. Uh, really, Gary and Dale really uh, they're all nice. But uh, they they knew I was nervous about doing it. Uh, of course, you know when I said yes, you know you're you're younger and you're like, oh yeah, I can do this. And I went, uh, what if I just agreed to do? <laughs> they they brought me over to their house and we watched some pre we watched free videos. Uh, and Gary loved it when I would play the thumb picking, you know, the Merle Travis stuff. He would have right. me play that stuff for him. But well, I was going to tell you, man, the Skinner thing. You know, we were getting the and. The very first gig I do with Skinner, and I think it was in Louisiana. So I, who is opening the show but my stepson, Johnny McGee and Black Cat Moan. I had How no cool is that? Freaking. Wow. Yeah, they were, doing some, they were doing some touring with those guys at that time. So that was just a fluke. And, of course, back then we didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't know. Uh, you know, of course, this thing – came up so fast uh, and things were just flying fast you know but the headhunters back then and so i, I got to hang out with johnny and that's Dave really cool yeah yeah they come running down the hall and uh, it was it was amazing i mean these things you just don't put this stuff together it's yeah. i don't know what you know, but uh yeah, Black Cat Bone. They they were they they had their record deal. They went out and done some touring, and then they kind of flew off the hinges around '92. Back about the same time that the original Headhunter band did, you know. And um, 
we had a couple of guys quit and one come back, but, uh, yeah, man, those are little, little, I, I don't think I'd ever told you that. No, ever. man, I had no <laughs> idea. And you know what? Um, it's, it's interesting because as an outsider, you, you look at the guys in Skinner, and they seem rough, but Jeff Carlisi said the same thing. He goes, you'd never find a nicer bunch of guys. They're, great. They're a great bunch of guys. He, he said they, cause he grew up with all these guys playing with them. And yeah. when he played in bands and his kids with them, and he said, you all of them were so nice, yeah. you know? And, uh, yeah, that's real. I, I had no idea. I can't believe that you, you got, you played with them and then you got asked to do the gig. Well, there's some video out there. It's and I and I have to be honest with you, I, I wasn't really playing the parts as well as I should have. But do you can go out there and look up Greg Martin or Skinner. Oh man, I'm going to today. Yeah, you, you can you can find a few things out there. Um, that's really cool, Craig, Greg. Craig Reed, who was the uh, one of the road crew guys, he had like a uh, a camera out there. He took a few film things, you know, and. Uh, I, I'm proud I got to do it. I, you know, uh, I, I still feel like we're, I don't see those guys very much, but last time I saw Gary, it, it was just so sweet, man. It, I saw him at uh, a Gibson function, you know, for a Southern rock tribute guitar they did. I think it was around 2015 or 16. And um, it was good. It's always good seeing him, man. Uh, I think a lot of Gary, I think uh, of all of them, you know. Speaking of Gibson, have they, any with since the new Gibson, any talk about bringing your guitar back out, your signature model, anything like that? Uh, yeah, there has been, and it's. I don't know if I'm. Well, me and Dave Rogers, you know Dave. Of course. Yeah, Dave. Dave's the one who uh, turned us on to it. Yeah, man, that was. Dave. Dave's one of the best guys in the business. Yeah, yeah. We keep we keep talking about Dave, maybe letting Dave do it through his store. That way we have more control over things, you know, like the pickups and things. Uh, so, yeah, there's talk about it. it. I think the last time Dave and I talked, he said, well, this is probably not the best time to do it because of the economy and the, the COVID. But we, we revisit, and I feel like it'll happen again at some That's point. That's great, man. That's I'd great. rather, if I was going to, I mean, nothing, I, the Gibson folks, I have to say, uh, dealing with Gibson was very, very good. Uh, they took care of me. They did the right things. But if I got to deal with Dave, it would be really even. Uh, oh, yeah, because he could handle all the direct stuff with Gibson, too. And that's like, I'm sure that you got to finesse that. And he's got the power to do that because of his, yes. you know, his his sales and his strength as a, as a retailer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. he's really got a great relationship with the company. Dave's a very fair person, good yeah. person. And so uh, he, we, we, maybe we'll revisit, uh, we get through 2020, we'll have 2020 vision. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, maybe next year we'll revisit that option and see if we can get something going, you know? Yeah. You, you know, it's funny, you mentioned the economy and I'm like, I'm looking at like the stock market and all these stores are having, rec and I, who's spending all this money? Oh, Nobody's sorry. working. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, not Dark nobody, market. but a lot of people are out of work, man. And, uh, I know. I know. Stock market's been really good. Matter of fact, it was it was down a little bit this morning, but uh, gosh, I can't complain. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, it just, I, I don't understand any of this stuff. It's just, uh, it, it's been a crazy year. And I never would have thinking you know going into this year thinking oh god having a year off and not working somehow by the grace of god we've gotten by maybe yeah. because just you know when you have to buckle down eat beans taters you know <laughs> do what you got to do man yeah. yeah oh i hear you man yeah it's crazy well th man thanks oh, for sharing no, that story i have no i had no oh, idea man. that was so cool oh well, yeah so so this that, that was I kind of bringing Johnny into that, but you were, I know you asked me about hard time killing floor and uh, yeah yeah that was Johnny's idea and and um, and uh, it, it's a cool little thing because it it, it was recorded live uh, there was a couple of overdubs on there but but basically it, it's just a live jam and that's I think that's kind of what you're picking up on you know oh it's great live. man it's great yeah I, one of my favorites too thank you. Um, you're welcome. Thank you for putting it out. Um, where did you, you just recorded that in your, in your house, in your studio? 
No, actually, uh, Barrick Studio here in Glasgow. David Barrick, we've done projects with David since since the 80s, late okay. 80s. I have. I've done everything from commercials, uh, little projects with him. Then the headhunters started working with him a little later on, I think around 96, 97. Uh, David's really good at capturing martial tones and stuff like that. It's, it's a, he's got a, as a matter of fact, he just moved the studio to a new location, which I'm looking forward to getting there and trying some stuff. But uh, no, uh, eventually I would like to have capabilities of doing overdubs here at the house, you know, because I could have my, some select amps here and, and my guitars are here, that's you know, right. but uh, it was done at Barrick studio and that's where we pretty much record at anymore. You know, does he, did he do the mixing on that as well? Yes. Yes. He took care of all. Yeah. It sounds really clean, man. Should we, should we choke him or anything? Or? <laughs> no, it sounds great, man. It sounds great. You more have, guitar, more. Let me tell you, man, you'd have, I, and I'm not just saying this to blow smoke. It'd be a hard time to have you play something and it not sound good. Yeah, and you oh, just, yeah. you got the magic in your fingers, man. You, you know, you're like a Leslie West sort of guy as far as your tone. It's just very distinct. It's, and the thing well, I love, this is what I love. I tell people this story when, when your name comes up. <laughs> so one of the things I love about Greg is as a player, uh, Remember when you were down here, you play, he said, Hey man, I got my pedal board tonight. And I look on the floor. It's a Wawa. <laughs> <laughs> that Wawa pedal. Yeah. Exactly. It's just you, it's nothing, just you and a the guitar and an amp. Well, you know, Craig, um, when I was coming up, you know, the, the first musical references would have been the Beatles, the love and spoonful, the stones. And, and of course, uh, I guess it was really uh, progressive when uh, Keith got the fuzz tone in 65 for uh, I can't get no satisfaction. satisfaction. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, I think when I heard Michael Bloomfield, oh, yeah, man. yeah, just plugged straight into a twin reverb or super reverb. I, I just see, I saw John Sebastian. We've talked about this. Yeah. I saw John Sebastian and the spoonful in November, 1966. And, um, that was the first time I'd ever seen a Les Paul. And of course, John, John is a great guitar player. He's not a, a lead player, but I'm sure he can, he can play lead, but I just was smitten by the look of that Les Paul and Gordon Kennedy now owns that guitar. You know oh, Gordon. No, I don't. No, who is he? You need to. You need to know Gordon. We need to hook you up. Yeah, who will? And uh, he owns that guitar. And I got to, I got to actually play that guitar about three years ago. You got to play Gibson. John Sebastian's guitar. Yeah, yeah, the one I saw first. You know, uh, that had a. It. Did you get a picture of that man? That had to be a good oh, feeling. Yeah. I got, I got some video. I was too nervous to really get the video right. But when I saw John play that guitar. Of course, the Spoonful were a, a very Americ. They were almost Americana for back then. I mean, they were mixing they rock. Pop. It was like pop, was like pop for back then, you know? Yeah, but they were mixing these elements of jug band music. And they were mixing country and, and made it this big, cool pop sound. Yeah. Of course, I, that was my first concert. And I, I just remember loving the look of that Les Paul. And then um, fast forward to 1968 when um, Super Session came out with Michael Bloomfield, Al Cooper, and Stephen Stills and Electric Flag about the same time. Uh, then I understood when you plug a Les Paul into a big tube amp what the sound, you know, the sound was. Then you start, I started reading about Eric Clapton using, you know, those guitars. And then you fast forward and you get Jimmy Page into the mix, Billy Gibbons uh the almond brothers so they were magic you know and um so but like i say i initially initially it was just basically um i just wanted i just, I just wanted a guitar with a lot of sustain of course hendrix I, we, all, we all loved hendrix yeah you know? hendrix was amazing uh different different bag of tricks you know 
Now, where am I going? <laughs> oh, I'm just, we're talking about your tone. I, I just said that your tone, anytime you plug in, it's you, well, and the pedal board. Well, basically, basically, it, it developed over time, and I never used that many effects. I tried effects in the 70s, uh, but I think the, the finding moment was uh, just plugging straight into a Marshall back in the 70s and going, I, I just didn't really need anything else, you know? Yeah. You I've know, never listened like, to Bloomfield or like Freddie King and said, man, they should have a chorus on there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just so pure, man. And so time, it's so raw and you know, the soul comes, it's, the, it's the selection, the finger, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah, it really it's a beautiful is. Thing. Um, I think when I first heard, um, of course, Jeff Beck was doing some pretty mind boggling things in 66 and 67 with the Yardbirds, but man, what really, one, I used to, uh, we lived in Metcalf County, and I, I used to hook up car radios in my house because you could pick up better signal. Oh, and, really? Uh, <laughs> yes, it, yeah. it had a better front end for, for receiving. I had like a little antenna outside, and I would listen to Chicago radio at night a lot. And one night I heard Sunshine of Your Love by Cream. And I just remember that tone and his vibrato. Yeah. It just, it hit me right then. I went, oh man. And then my brother, when he got married in 68, he gave me a box of records. He went into bluegrass and he gave me some B.B. King stuff, Travis Womack, Lonnie Mack. But I remember when I first heard B.B. King, I went, oh man there's a connection between, you know, the cream and that. And, uh, it was just basically not a, it was just guys plugged into an amp playing from their heart. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, heart and hands basically. Yeah. You, yeah. Know? You, you don't listen to buddy guy and say something's missing here, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So I, I'm, well, I'm the buddy, same way. Yeah. Buddy does, uh, polka dots really <laughs> <laughs> well it's just a, st a strat and an amp you know he's got yeah, nothing exactly. between there you know he's just I can, you can you just know with one note when you hear that guy well man man a lot of these guys we're talking about you can hear one note two notes and you know who they are yeah you know um and i'm sure it's still like that now but the, but i i'm not as uh inclined to hear new stuff like i used to be but man there was a period between 67 and like early seventies that every week there'd be a discovery of some new player. It just mind boggling, man. Yeah. Just, I used to love those trips to the record store to, to, to do that research. Basically that was your encyclopedia. Man. That was your yeah. internet, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It was just a, you know, and I mean, you know, we heard, I, had to, I could just, I was telling some friends the other day, I said, I can remember the first time I heard, <laughs> Mississippi Queen by Mountain. I, I I was pulling into a little church in Midcalf County one Sunday morning, and that came on. I went, "Oh my lord!" <laughs> yeah. it, it just blew my mind hearing that. And I can yeah. remember the first time of hearing, um, like I say, "Sunshine of Your Love" um, coming out of WLS or WCFL in Chicago. And then I can remember the first time I heard a whole lot of love. There was just defining moments that just seeming at something that was going to be your blueprint, I guess, you know, for life. And um, it's just, just amazing times. You mentioned, I just want to, uh, you mentioned Stephen Stills on the yeah. uh, Super Sessions. There's a really good documentary on Amazon right now uh, about CSNY. It was pretty interesting. It, it talks about the whole evolution of the band and the highs and the lows that they experience. So if you, if anybody listening wants to check that out, it's pretty good. It's worth your time. Is it about Buffalo Springfield? And, and different no, stuff? just CSNY and just the highs and lows. And, you know, they talk, you know, stills had a terrible, terrible addiction. It was, oh. You know, Crosby as well. I mean, they all had, you know, not all Crosby and stills particularly had some pretty bad drug addictions and that was the downfall of the band a lot and then like neil young and graham nash were sort of like the alpha dogs and so yeah. that caused a lot of stress it's, but if you think about it man think of a marriage right to keep that going you both have to make concession or any relationship long term now imagine four people 
much. So it makes sense that it's going to be more challenging, you know? Right. I never, you know, I met, we met David Crosby. This is so funny. We were at the Grammys. It was 91 or 92. And we pull up in front of the Roosevelt Hotel in this old bus. <laughs> we, we, owned, we owned one of Elvis's old buses for a while. That's awesome. You know? Yeah, TCB. But anyway, <laughs> we pull up, and, and, and you could see uh, David Crosby just looking like, who is this? There's been two times I can remember these guys having these looks. And and he walks over, and he says, he sees us. He says, they don't let anybody in this place. <laughs> he said that? Yeah. yeah he was, oh, he my was God. Oh, he was okay. Laughing. Oh, he was kidding. He yeah. wasn't, yeah. We, got, we talked a second. He gave me his... So man, call me. We'll have coffee or something. And I never, you know, and I never did call him. Never did call him. I should have. Of course, I was a. Let's call him right now. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, yeah. Well, it was his room number back at the Roosevelt. But the thing is, of course, back then I was like, oh God, well, what? I didn't know what where his head was at. Yeah. So I don't want to get around any of the craziness. But he was really nice. Really yeah. nice. And the only other time I've seen a guy had a look on his face like that. We played Farm Aid for the first time, and we're setting up, and there's Jackson Brown off looking at us, and he had this confused look on his face like, like, who, what is this? No, <laughs> really? Yeah, it wouldn't, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah. He's just trying to figure us out. He's like, who are these hillbillies, R ragamuffins, you know? <laughs> that's weird. But um, So that's where you met, or you, you did you meet Wanchik there? Because they I played met, all uh, those. I met Mike. Yeah, at Farm Aids. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. I I don't know Mike well, but see that my stepdaughter Sherry used to work with Mike's dad in Lexington at a. Um, wow. It was like a veterans hospital or something. You can you talk to Mike every now and then, right? Well, he's coming on the show next week. Ask his dad. Remembers. His dad ran uh, the largest. Uh, rehab addiction hospital in the country. Yeah, it was in Lexington. Yes, in Lex and, and, my, and my my stepdaughter knew knew Mr. Wanchek. Yeah, he, uh, I met him too. I met him. Uh, so there's a connection there. Yeah, you know? and, that's well. It's interesting. Well, that uh, Mike used to go there, and it being in the, I think this was in the, because he's a little bit older than me. So this is probably in the early or mid 60s he was a young kid mm -hmm. and he'd go there all the patients were jazz musicians that's right so he would go there and they would do shows and he would learn and talk with these guys and learn stuff from them you know there's a i, I think there was a live record remember the group called pacific gas and electric i sure do okay are you ready there is a live recording that was recorded there. I don't know how those guys ended up doing a live recording there, but if you look on the internet, Lexington, Kentucky, Pacific Gas and Electric, check that out and see if it's not there. So there, there, there was, like you say, there must have been a lot of musicians at that rehab. Yeah. You know, live in Kentucky. And so I, I probably met Mike. I've become aware of Mike. Of course, I knew who John Mellencamp's band were. You know, they they were from above Louisville, and Mike had Kentucky roots. Uh, That's right. But my stepdaughter, my, my stepdaughter knew knew Mike and his dad. But had Mellencamp had a great band, man. Still does, oh, I'm sure. He, he's Still, had loads of really good guys in his. Who was playing the? Other, did he have two guitars at that time when you did Farm Aid? Yeah, yeah. What's the other fellow's name? Oh, Andy gosh. York. Yeah, well, Andy came in. Uh, when I oh. first uh, saw the, the original band, oh, there was a uh, Grissom? Mike. Yeah. No, this is before Grissom. There was another fellow that helped write some of the songs. Okay. Um, I don't know who that was. I, yeah, I can't think of it. Well, he, he wasn't there very long. Well, he was there for a while, but then he left. Then Grissom came in. And then when Grissom left, Andy came in. Andy came know. in, yeah, because Andy's yeah. been with him. And I, met I, Andy years, I met Andy years ago. I've known, yeah. I've known Dave, too. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, man, Me Mellencamp's got a great band. He writes yeah. great songs. What yeah. can you he, say? Man? No, he yeah. does, man. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
what was the most enjoyable thing about putting this record together? It was the com camaraderie, uh, just the fellowship. It was just like a little adventure. It, like I say, there was no plans. As you know, we talked that morning. And I went to the studio. We hooked up some amps, and we just started laying down the grooves. Just, it was a kind of a surreal day because it's. <laughs> I remember that night when we got done. It came a crazy snow, and it was starting to stick. You know. Wow. <laughs> you, know, you know, it was just just get to record with these guys. We just had so much fun. Uh, there was a lot of spontaneous moments, like um, Dave Barrick would get an idea say, okay, won't you guys lay down a funky groove, which um, ended up being uh, what you do me, do mm -hmm. me that way, got the wah-wah pedal. Yep. And that, that was just written right on the spot, you know, just written on the spot. And then like I say, Johnny, it's, it's just the spontaneity. There's no plan of monetary gain. Obviously, would like to make ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It, it's it's funny, man. Not funny, but it's re, it's true. You know, back in the day, people would record, and they owe the studio a lot of money, exactly. and and but they can go out and do it now you record you don't owe the studio as much money but you still hope to get it back and that's a, a push yeah man. at least breaking even would be yeah. a good thing yeah this just this was just a labor of love um uh, we had no plans you know and um uh, you know we weren't thinking well we could get a label to, well we, obviously it'd be great if some little label picked it up that that would uh wouldn't require us to get out and tour <laughs> and i'm not saying i hate touring i just uh i got another band i gotta uh, you know that's what i do for a living you know yeah, but, man. Uh, but man just the camaraderie with dean and johnny getting to do that we had we had because johnny lives in lexington and he's got seven kids he don't get he don't get yeah he don't get down here very oh often. Oh my God! He was probably <laughs> thrilled to be working all night long <laughs> in a studio. Yeah, he had, he had oh fun. Oh my yeah. God! Seven kids. God yeah. bless him. Yeah. He must have a high tolerance of the patience he level. He does. Very patient. Very patient boy. And, wow! Uh, wow! And, uh, he uh, he loved coming down. Of course, Ruth loved seeing him. <laughs> but yeah, right sure. now, we haven't seen him. We we've seen him one time since the pandemic. Yeah. We met at Cave City at mcdonald's outside and we ate a little bit and kind of hung out but uh yeah that's tough that was tough but we didn't see our kids my daughter still lives with us but my yep. son for about two two and a half months it because i they usually here almost once a week you know and uh that was that was rough it was you know. yeah yeah man it's it's been crazy it's it's crazy uh i don't i don't mind being off the road but the only thing, you know, my traveling chops are down now, you know, they're oh. way down, you know, every, where every, I am. Uh, everybody, just so it make you feel better. I've had loads of guys I've spoken to and they're like, man, I got a gig coming up and I, I don't even know where to start. My fingers don't have any uh, calluses yeah. anymore. Yeah. I mean, everybody's, you know, experiencing the same thing in one form. Exactly. Or exactly. And I was really looking forward to going down on the 13th um, or the 12th. And um, I was looking forward to it because I felt, oh, man, I feel like I'm, you know, uh, it's, it's good playing music. It's good playing getting in front of people. Um, traveling, I don't mind traveling. I, as you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't like traveling too far. Yeah. But, but, but uh, well, don't worry. There's no country letting anybody. <laughs> no. No, I'm You're just safe saying for a while. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be um, a while. Yeah. Hey, what are your favorite songs on the record? Um, I really, for different reasons, um, I like the first track, What You Do To Me. It's just a, it's just a, like an old rock and roll groove type thing. It's, it, it kind of mixes the elements of uh, country and rock, you know. Uh, maybe, maybe it's NRBQ influenced a little bit. And uh, I played a Telecaster on that, believe it or not. Yeah, and um, I don't see you doing that too much. You went through a phase. Love, you got a telly and you went through a little telly phase. And then I think yeah. you, you snapped out of it or something like that. <laughs> I love tellies. I absolutely love tellies. Uh, as long as I don't, I think that the greatest 
great rhythm guitar. I, I think they're great. Period. I think because I, I, I mean, we got a lot of friends that 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 would argue with it that the greatest guitar ever made. They're great, you know. Um, I love them. I just um, I haven't found. I had the right one. I had a '57. I should have never got rid of. <laughs> Long time I've had, ago. I you... had two. I got rid of it about three or four years ago, but I've had, man, I've had two 53s. I've had a 57. I had a 59. Uh, it, it, when you find the right one, you need to hang on to it. Uh, I'm still, I'm looking for another telly, uh -oh. but I'm not, <laughs> yeah, but, but not, an old, I'm not an old one. I can't afford that. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking maybe, I'm thinking maybe in the 67, 68, because man, I'm really, the last few months have really, got more into like rhythm listening to people like reggie young oh yeah uh, jimmy johnson uh steve cropper and who were lead players but they were very rhythmic you know oh and, reggie was just amazing man I, I had him on here and he was just such a sweet yes, guy did. he was just yes, such a and it was funny i was talking to him this is we i don't think we recorded videos back then but it was they were in there it was him and his wife and his wife was uh, helping him yeah. you know he was 81 he, he didn't know skype or zoom and his wife but i felt like i was with them there they made me feel like i was getting ready for them they asked me to have dinner like after the interview it was just very like at home dealing with oh them. man craig one of the biggest regrets and i have lots of them but uh, i could have actually got to know reggie better when i started playing with ronnie mcdowell in 81 he was having a lot of big country hits and and reggie was always on his records and why i did not just go down to the sessions to watch him work to get to know him i don't know my, my yeah. head was the right place for some reason uh I, I always knew reggie was just a sweetheart of a guy and played the right always the right thing oh, yeah. oh, always you know what was, um I think when you're, cause I I've done stuff like that, you know, you, you're more vulnerable, you're more insecure and, and, and you don't realize that everybody's pretty much the same, Yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, no matter where they even are in the financial or success, they're worried about their families. They got to take yes. care of their families. You know, hopefully their kids listen to them when they're young, they got bills to pay no matter how much money, but you don't realize some of this. You think that if you, somebody has a certain level that, they don't have the same pro problems that you do or you everybody know, got something going don't they? everybody man but you realize that when you get older and you also just care less like about you know like if they, i meet somebody they like me cool if they don't that's their problem not mine well as you get older you just know what you do and you yeah. do it uh, i when i started with ronnie mcdowell in the fall of 81 i had come right out of a rock and roll with Richard and Fred, we had a rock and roll band. And, you know, we came real close to signing with Swan Song. Mm. And that's another story within itself. And it just didn't work out. It was things going on. And, um, you know, it's just like, um, I never would have thought about going to Nashville. But it was the best thing that I could have ever done. And it, it, wasn't, my, it wasn't my choice. I think somebody else made it for me. I just kind of yeah. followed. Yeah. And uh, I played with Ronnie. I got to uh, work with uh, Buddy Killen, who produced a lot of the old Joe Tex records and a lot of the old soul records. He actually actually had uh, uh, Greg and Dwayne sign when they were with the Almond Joys. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, on Dial Records. So, you know, I, only thing I didn't take advantage of back then is like getting to know Reggie, uh, getting to know some of those really good studio players, because those guys just knew when to play and when not to play, and they yeah. played the right. And uh, I mean, especially God, in Nashville, they there's no, it's never, my opinion anyway, from all the guys I've spoken to, it's not ever been about me, meaning them exactly it's, they know they're there to serve the music exactly and, and they're so committed to delivering it's about the song best they could do to, to serve that particular song man you right. know and they're that, selfless I, selfless well when i was ronnie i learned that i learned restraint i learned 
you know, not to overplay. Of course, <laughs> you put me in a three-piece thing. It's time. Well, oh, come here's, on. Here's, That's a, just... here's, a, here's a note that you have. <laughs> Let's see how many notes it's I can hit. But, but totally I really different. am so grateful about those, uh, about the 80s, about uh, getting to hang out with people like, I just didn't get to hang out with Reggie. I hate that. Mm. Uh, I finally got to meet Brent Rowan, uh, not Brent Rowan. He was another player, Brent Mason. Uh, you know, of course, I, I didn't get to know a lot of the studio guys, you know. Yeah. Really. He's so, very, another very nice guy, you know, and he's so talented. I, I know he is. He's so was talented. Very sweet. Very sweet. Yeah. So talented. I think, and as you, you, you talked about, I think it's, it's not about it, I'm, that ego. It's about insecurities that keep you from doing a lot of that stuff, you know. When you're young, you know, I mean, that's, that's the way it happens. So. It's funny because I ask the number. I ask people often what's been the biggest change, and most of my guests are o over fifty, so they're baby boomers. Or oh, man, so you got me. I'm forty five. Yeah, man, you're under, but I'll make an allowance. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, and that. So the number one answer to that question is some form of, I'm more comfortable in my skin, or I care less what others think of me, or. I'm okay with who I am. I know who I am. It's some version of that. And I, that happens through age and getting beat up enough. And then it's just like, you know, man, I'm just like going to do my thing. And, and if, you know, whatever. Yeah, it, yeah man, it's the, uh, it's the trials that kind of really shape your character. Yeah, totally. When you're younger, you think that other people, what they think of you is going to do things for you. It's not. When you're older, you realize... Yeah. I got to feel this inside. That's the only person I need to account to. Oh, they're going through their, their own little wars, you know, or battles, you know. And, totally. And, but uh, when I first went to Nashville, I was, like I say, I was playing with um, Richard and Fred and Anthony, and we, it just didn't work out what we were trying to do. It came close. Uh, one afternoon, I got a call from uh, – a guy I played in a band, a horn band with, and he's, of course, Ronnie McDowell was having these really big country hits at that time. And, and he said, and I was, I was, I had been married about two years. And I said, well, I got to work, you know, I got to go to work. And so I went down audition one afternoon at uh, Ronnie's studio. And he said, well, can you do Hee Haw tomorrow? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, then, and then at night we played, uh, a CBS record show with Merle Haggard and the strangers. And Man, you it, was, it was right, just amazing. Jumped into the deep end. Yeah. I, I way above my head. And, and it, at the time I thought, Oh man, I want to rock and roll, man. I want to, I want to, but, but it was the best thing I could have ever done because it taught me restraint. It taught me to, to respect the song and, Man, when you're out touring with people, it's not about being the best player. It's about being the best person on the bus, getting along with people, you know. Yeah. So I was talking to someone yesterday. I think it was Noah Levy, who is the uh, uh, drummer for Brian Setzer and played a lot of other gigs. And he said, yeah. he said the thing is, someone told him a long time ago, can you give good bus? You know, <laughs> are you a good hang on the bus? Can you give good yeah. bus? And I was like, yeah, that's to that's some version of like what everybody says, you know, exactly, exactly. It's about uh, getting along with people, you know, and, you know, obviously when you're in a band, it's a, it's a marriage. It's a, you're going to have head butting sessions. <laughs> of course. Not, yeah. You know, but um, yeah, it's about getting along, man. And I was lucky, uh, but looking back at Ronnie's band, it really was a good solid band and uh, learned a whole lot. Uh, people could go back and listen to some of that stuff and go, man, you weren't playing much. I said, well, that's fine because that's just what I was supposed to do. Right. It's like you say, serving the song, you know? Totally. So, hey, I want to talk about uh, yeah. your your radio show um, because I know you put a lot of energy into that. I know how much you love doing it. I don't want more people to check it out. So tell, talk about it. Where can people find it and talk about it? I know you've been doing it a long time. Well, um, I've always had a great love for radio. You know, of course, I grew up during the AM boom. Because when I started listening to radio in 65, 64, FM was basically just uh, for like uh, orchestra music and stuff like that. There was very few of those stations. 
and I just love there, there was two things in life that really kind of stuck with me as a as a, a kid that I really wanted to pursue. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to play guitar, play guitar in a band, and and the other thing I thought was more un, unattainable was doing radio. And um, so grew up listening to radio and uh, I did my, I started doing my first radio show at a little FM station in Mumfordville, Kentucky in 1986. On Monday nights, I did this thing called Blue Monday. I did it for a few months and <laughs> the station was just kind of hanging on for dear life. Uh, it was a FM it, it was mono, FM mono, because the, the I didn't even heard something of that. was, yeah, right, right. We, was, we couldn't was, afford the second channel. What the hell? Something was blown up. <laughs> it wasn't, um, yeah, it was. And, and so I did that for a while. And then the headhunter thing hit. And of course, you know, I got really busy. But in 97, a station in Campbellsville, Kentucky, I, I did a guest spot up there one night and they said, now, would you ever consider doing a radio show? And I thought, well, you know, I'd love to try. And um, so, so in November of 97, I started doing a radio show up there and I went into the spring of like 2000. Um, at that time, Craig, uh, I had an engineer that would help me run the board and stuff like that. And he decided he wants, he was going to leave. And I said, well, I guess I'd better take a break. And then about that same time, I had an offer to go to um, WDNS in Bowling Green. And so November of, I don't know why November is so prominent here. Yeah, it's a big month here. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, so in November of uh, 2000, uh, November of uh, 2001, I started doing the Lowdown Hoedown there. And so we've been, we've been, down, I've been in Bowling Green for it's 19 years, years, man. Yeah. Yeah. So the show, the lowdown hoedown has been around for uh, 21 and a half years, you know, counting the other station, but um, it's basically, it was uh, when I was approached about it, they wanted me to do a Southern rock show. Now I like Southern rock. It's not the, my go-to music. What I really love is R and B and blues and I love the rock and roll we grew up with I just said well listen I would consider doing a show if you'll let me do an R&B blues show and that's what I did of course I take liberties with the genres uh, hey, it's your show I mean, yeah I just I might but you, you like, know what you stick please. pretty close to that that's a pretty big yeah, also wide net man you got a lot of flexibility there man yeah yeah I, I mean I mean some weeks I might want to play cream i might want to play some hendrix or stuff that i grew up with it's all uh steeped in the blues yeah. you know and uh, so like this past week i played some joe tex and a lot of matter of fact a lot a lot of deep soul southern soul music so it just man i just enjoy playing music for people hey <laughs> it's not about me playing guitar it's just me like hey have you heard this before this that it's like inviting people over to your living room right you know say check this out you know so let me ask you this yeah. sorry i didn't mean to cut you off greg ahead i apologize no no what this is a weird question but every week you get all your records together from your collection and bring them this is the question yeah. i want to ask you when you come home that night I know you don't put them away. You put them in a stack. <laughs> you put them in a stack somewhere. How often well, does that, that that got me in trouble? <laughs> uh, I've got about a bo two boxes that have to go back in alphabetical order this week because you're right. Uh, <laughs> I, you would not believe the mess that my garage was in back right. in the summer. <laughs> yeah. No, I've got to get back. I've got to get. I've got when I got didn't feel too good about two weeks ago. I, I, I kind of got behind on putting my stuff back in order, you know. So. Is this, you know how I know? Because I have all the questions on the sheet. And at the end, <laughs> and at the end, at the end of the, 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 the conversation we have, I take this and I put it over here next to the scanner. 
that pile is about four inches thick because I don't <laughs> scan. Because who the hell wants to do? Who wants to put away? It's the fun is in creating, not you know. And so I was wondering what your. I said, I bet this is a guy who does the same thing with his records. Exactly. Yeah, because who wants to come home? Oh, put away records. Who's looking forward to that? You know. Right, and it got me in a lot of trouble. I mean, I had to have I had to have a lot of shelving built this summer. Yeah. Uh, well, I had a friend, thank God, I had a friend in Glasgow that retired from the hospital. He was a janitor. And uh, and I hired him to come over, and we worked about three days a week all summer. And uh, he built some new shells. Uh, I got plenty of room right now. Well, I'll send you some pictures. Yeah, tonight. do that, man. So, I'd like to yeah, see it. Can. And uh, but uh, I've got a lot of work to do still. I've got I've got um, a new board. I got to get hooked up. Uh, there's so much stuff to do. I, matter of fact, I would have Boone Frog. It was been helping me. But I got, uh, you know, <laughs> I had my little setback yeah. a few weeks ago, which I'm feeling better now. But uh, I, uh, I got to get back in the groove again. Get the things. It's good to have a to-do list, though, man. You know, when you have no more to-do list, what happens then, right? You know, I like having man, a to-do you're, list. You're really, you're really organized. I, I, I can't imagine you. You have to be. I have. I'm, yeah. I have uh, you to. have. I have. I, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants. Which, uh, you know, I guess flexibility is okay in some, but it, it can also get you in a, a rabbit hole. <laughs> you know, you can. Well, I'm organized. Doesn't mean everything gets done. It just means I have it in a list of to do. Well, that's all. and I, I know you're busy. You're a busy guy, man. You, the interviews, I, I don't even know how you, all the editing stuff you do and all that, it's, it, just, it just blows me away because I'm not very. No, we don't do much, Greg. We don't do a lot of editing here. <laughs> if someone okay. goes, if someone, I, I couldn't put out that much. Con you know, there's, uh, I had to make a decision early on when I set the show up. There's a lot of people edit out, like when they say, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, how can I do that with a two hour show sometimes? No, or three? I, and I don't care. I mean, if I, I'm not, and then you when I, yeah, if someone, I'm going to say, um, that's, I mean, I'm okay with, I'm okay. Again, I'm 57 now, so I'm okay. Maybe when I was 35, it would have bugged me. I don't right. care now. I want to put out good content. And I think, you know, that's, was my priority. And so I had to make certain decisions and do I yeah. want to spend my time editing or spend my time talking with people and having a good time. And Absolutely. It's fellowship, man. Yeah. And that's that's what we need. We need yeah. Especially this year, we need good fellowship, man. It's, uh, oh, wow. It's just, it's just amazing. Uh, hey, hold on a year. second. Be before I forget, I just the radio. Mm -hmm. Where can people listen to? Oh, the radio. The radio. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Got to keep no, you on. Okay. I got to keep you on track on my to-do list. <laughs> you, have to, you have to keep me on track, man. I, I, I'll run. I'll run you right off. I, I'll run off the rail here. Uh, the best way to, for folks listening out there on the internet, you can go to www.wdnsfm dot com right and there should be a listen live there or you can go to the tune in app do you know what the tune in app is no it's a just go to your app store and look for tune in and when you go when you get that loaded in you can look for d93 wdns and you can listen to the show online like that now oh, it's cool. yeah it's on it's on the it's on Every week from Central Time, seven to ten, three hours. Now, uh, is, is it recorded? You no, know, man. Only time I, uh, if I just can't be there, uh, I have some pre-recorded shows. Okay. I do them live. I, lo I just love the aspect of doing it live. And um, I, I was there this past Monday night, which yeah. was good. Got yeah. to do it. Um, uh, if you're in South Central Kentucky. You just uh, 93.3 FM. And remember, Central Time, 7 to 10. At, and then you can make the adjustments for all you folks in England and all your folks <laughs> in Scotland. And <laughs> Does, uh, and, and tell me, as far as the record, Eclectic La Lazy Land, I'm yeah. sorry. You're yeah. releasing singles on that now. We're releasing singles off that. And I'm going to have my 
partner in crime, Dean, get in touch with you on that. Yeah. Uh, Give me a link or something so I can post it with the interview. Yeah, we're going to get you. We'll get, we'll get, we're going to take care of you on that. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's 12 songs. Um, 11 of them are, um, 11 are original, you know, they end up, the only cover is Hard Time Killing oh, Floor. Yeah. Just, a, just an old um, Skip James tune. Uh, what You Do To Me starts off the album. Get Me Out, out of Memphis. Uh, Jimmy Reed T-shirt. Billy yeah, Gibbons. Yeah, that's, a, that's another one. Right? I like that. I like that song. Yeah, it's a yeah. good story, right? Yeah. Uh, good. Rosie. Rosie is about Johnny's dog. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you got seven yeah. kids. God bless uh, everyone, that guy, man. He's a great writer. Uh, every one of these songs have got little stories, you know. Um, Lonesome Lincoln Blues has significance, something about high school, about his first girlfriend or something. I don't know. Bro, uh, neck tattoo is funny. You yeah, that was funny. That? Yeah, that was really, <laughs> really funny. Flat Black Chrome is kind of a takeoff on his old band, Black Cat Bone. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. You and them guys get together and uh, – I mean, it's just, it's just a fun, it's, it's kind of eclectic, you know, and it wasn't planned out. I think getting in the studio and not having a, a plan sometimes can be really good or it can just take you down the tubes real fast. Too, you know? And it's a fun record. It's got Thank some you. great, great Thank blues you. on it. You are playing great as usual. And you guys it. are all very, you know, you guys are very tight together. And uh, it's a great, it's a nice little record, man. I'm happy you made it. And, um, I'm, thank you so much for uh, sharing. Oh, oh, thank, thank you, man. I'm, I'm just uh, grateful that we get to. I just take this year has been kind of one of those years that uh, we're, we're building momentum, you know, and keeping our chops up and stuff. Uh, Got to get back into Chop City here pretty soon, right? Yeah, man, totally. Traveling chop playing chops and stuff like that any but, any word uh, on the headhunters when if anything will be opening up because I, I get your emails uh, it seems you. like you're going to be doing gigs we we got a lot of gigs on the schedule uh it looks like around february, february. Like february we, unless we get into a situation again and i don't think i think it's going to get better next year uh craig i i, uh, I think so too i once we get the vaccines and people's confidence is better you know i'm not i think i think things will get a lot better next year i think around february i'm gonna say february march next year uh, everybody's just pretty much hold up nobody wants to get sick you know yeah i know and uh, uh richard and fred stay down on the farm <laughs> you know let me let me tell you fred keeps time yeah as, as good at i He's one of my favorite yep. drummers. I mean, his yep. he's a Swiss watch, man. That guy, yes, it's impeccable how his – It's, his, it's, it's phenomenal. It, it That's really what he was is. supposed to do in life, no uh, doubt. Uh, absolutely. I mean, he is – It's a, you could set a clock with him, man. He's phenomenal. He really yeah. is. Really is, man. As well, one of the drummers. It's, this whole band is just one of these things that just uh, – it's way bigger than any of us in the band. It's like it was uh, somehow we all found each other at the right time in our lives, you know. And uh, I met Richard in 1968 by doing a 4 H talent show. You know? <laughs> That's cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> and then I, through him, I got to meet Fred and their cousin Anthony, who's a phenomenal musician. And of course, Doug, I met when I joined Ronnie McDowell's band in 1981, it, it, there's just so many little connecting things that, that, there, that we didn't have control of. It, they were just like destiny, I guess, you know? Yeah. That's the way everything works. It seems. I, I was music. so wanting to be a rock and roll Jimmy Page star. It just didn't work out, man. You are. <laughs> thank you. You I, are, man. <laughs> thank you, man. I'm, I'm going to go out here and, out here in the driveway and start cranking here in a minute. Get your Marshall and get your get your Les Paul. Oh, oh gosh, Derek could love that, wouldn't he? <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. I've got to wrap up, Greg. Um, but I want to just tell people, Greg was on the show a couple of years back. Was yeah. one of the question I often, the most common question I get is, "What's your favorite interview?" It's really hard to say because I've had so many wonderful, but Greg's is definitely up there on the list oh. all the time. He taught me so much about being a kind human being and what that really means. Well, 
And, you know, I really appreciate that. It was an unexpected, very great lesson. So thank you. Well, and, it's uh, a lot easier to be nice to people than being mean to them. And, and we've, had, <laughs> we've had people, I guess, situations before they're questionable, you know. And if you, if you was to meet this guy in the alley, you'd go. Yeah, man, that's, that's right. I don't know why I keep pulling that picture. That's up. a good picture, it. man. That's a, that's a fun <laughs> picture. I was somebody, wasn't it? It's uh, funny. I see old pictures of you, and you, you have that young, like, scowl sometimes. And I'm like, <laughs> holy shit, I wouldn't have messed with that guy. And you're the sweetest guy I've literally ever you met. Know, you know, it's funny how you can misjudge people. Cause, uh, totally. Because Warren Haynes and, and Alan Woody, those guys, they look like they'd just bite your head off. But they're the sweetest people. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, I don't know, man. It's uh it's been a very, very interesting run. And as you see, as, as you get older, and we're both getting older, uh, it's an adventure. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's an adventure, you know. Hey, well, I will look forward to you coming on again the next time oh, I'm just talking you. to you. And uh, I'm going to put Greg's original interview, the audio of it, if you're listening to the podcast on audio right afterwards. Um, if you're listening on video, you can just go back and check out the audio show. Um, and I would love everybody to check out Greg's radio show is called the Lowdown Hoedown. You can find it. it it's live on uh, WDNS 7 to 10 on Monday night, 7 to 10 Central Time. So that's like 8 to 11 if you're in New York and you ain't got to figure it out after that. Uh, yeah. WDNSFM.com or mm -hmm. you can go on the app store and get what's I'm sorry, Greg, what's the app called? Tune in. Tune, Tune in. Yeah, I wrote really, it. Dash I, I can never read okay. my own writing anymore. It's a, it's a yeah. really cool. It's a really cool little app. I listen to it. Uh, man, I you know I have various stations programmed. You know I want to listen. If I want to listen to the news to knock me out or something. <laughs> <laughs> so so go to the app store and get tune in, and you look for WDNS live seven to ten, or you can go to ninety three point. Just look up ninety three point three and WDNS. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you some information if you thanks. Do good. To make sure I got that, uh, it's it's a great little station. It's a it's an independent station. It's not owned by a big corporation. Uh, they still have four live DJs during the day. That's cool. Uh, they're, they're good. They're good people. Uh, every one of the staff is great. The the manager is great. Uh, Brian Locke, the guy that hired me to do my show down there, he's a he is just one of the greatest radio people you'd ever meet. You know. Uh, I've been lucky because, because like I told you, man, the things that drew me, I love records, I love guitars, and I love radio. So I got to got to experience that stuff, you know. Yeah, and you're so passionate about the show that comes through every time what you're doing. Man. I love it. I love yeah. this. Yeah, you can see. Music. Yeah. yeah. And you know. and where I'll I'll put out the link to check out the new record again. It's called yeah. e Eclectic Lazy Land. It's uh, under the, the band name of Martin Smith McGee. Um, I'll yep. put the link out when I drop this episode out. And um, man, it's always great talking to you. Oh, you too, man. It's, it's always wonderful. We just, uh, we could talk all day. Yeah. And I, have, I have Dean Smith get in touch with you and he can, y'all can, he's, he's the marketing guy. I'm, I'm no good at that stuff. I'm sorry. Hey, well, if everybody was good at the same thing, we'd all have nothing to do, right? Well, I need to be better, man. People, musicians need to diversify now, as we see. A little bit, yeah, man. But you know what, musicians need to be doing, and I'm guilty of this. Need to be writing a really good song. Yeah, COVID is probably inspiring a lot of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, COVID, COVID, uh, it's our friend. <laughs> I guess I don't know what it is. Anyway, Greg, I got to wrap up. Um, okay, buddy. Th thanks for everything. Everybody, thanks. thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Again, I'm going to put Greg's original interview on the audio aspect of the podcast so you can hear it. Phenomenal interview, one of my favorites. Uh, thanks very much to Greg Martin for spending time with us. Again, check out the new record. I'll have links when I post this. Eclectic Lazy Land. Check out Greg's radio show, The Lowdown Hoedown, on WDNSFM.com. I really encourage you to check it out. He has such a good time doing it, man, and that enthusiasm is infectious, and it's, it's, it's nice. And, and, if, and if the headhunters come to your town, come see us. Come see them, man. These guys are a lot of fun, and um, 
I think if you send Greg checks, he might play some songs that you like on his radio show. <laughs> <laughs> Payola lives. Payola lives. Payola. Just, send, just send, me a, send me a burger. I'll yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, remember, happiness is really important, man. Remember that happiness really is a choice, man. So Absolutely. choose wisely, especially nowadays, man. I read Love something. Love each other. Love each yeah. other, man. Don't let, don't let this crazy... I'm not going to get political because I, I don't do that, but don't let this stuff get in the way of loving each other, man. Yeah. Was, totally. Man. Love each other. Love each other, man. Send me ham. Send him hammer. And real quick, I read this article of the day and it said, change one word in your life and it changes everything. It's a lot of people wake up and say, I have to do this. I have to do that. And he said, change that have to, to get to, I get to yes. do this. And it like totally shifts your mindset from, burden to gratitude man and uh, not not to get all flighty but man it's a weight off your chest when you're happy about attitude of gratitude uh, yeah, uh, you know there's you know jack pearson right? oh yeah yeah I, yeah i had jack on here yeah yeah that's right that's right um jack we played a, a slide guitar summit for arlen Roth about four or five years ago and i love jack's attitude he says we're so lucky we get to do this. Yeah. You know, he said, I, it's a privilege to get to play. And he's so right about yeah, that. Totally. Totally. The business, the business can suck the life out. I, I'm not saying you got to have the business in covered and know what you, you know, you don't want to get ripped off, but man, sometimes the business can just take the joy out of it. And you don't want to, you know, there's a, a difference between, of course, happiness and joy. Joy is just, when things go wrong, here you go. Okay, it's going to get better. You know, yeah, it's going to get better. You know, and uh, this year has taught us so much about that. Totally, man. And God's good to us. He's going to be good to us, man. We're going to make it. Everybody when will. I, when I come back, I'm going to be just. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, thank you for everything. I appreciate it. And uh, oh, I love everybody, check out the record. Likewise, man. Thank Take care, you. and I'll talk to you real soon.